Good evening, everyone. Happy Sabbath for those who it may be Sabbath. Um, and uh, welcome to this evening's study. Now, um, we're going to continue, of course, reading A.T. Jones, 1895 General Conference Bulletin Presentations. This is the Third Angel's Message, number 12. Um, and it's going to be page 216 of the General Conference Bulletin. But you can see these pageations are put in there to match the General Conference Bulletin uh, pageation or pagination, however you say that word. Anyway, let's begin with a word of prayer. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, we are very grateful for the time that we have here uh, this evening as we open your word together in the reading of A.T. Jones, his sermon from 1895. And Lord, we know that the truths that he is presenting are truths for our time, even though it's a long time ago in some respects. We know, Lord, that that time parallels our own and that all the things that have happened in sacred history and in the past are all uh, paralleling events in the present. And so, Lord, we just ask that we can have understanding of the things that we read, that you can bring to our minds through your Holy Spirit, um, an understanding that, uh, that you want us to have and that we can be affected by it, that we can share the truth with others. Be with us now, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Good evening again. So um, we're just going to start reading. Now, the last time I read this 1895 General Conference bulletin articles, I mean, I know I first read them in the uh, 1980s, and uh, I know I read them again sometime since then. I was trying to figure out when. It's probably the 1990s. Um, if I had read them sooner than that, it would have been like 2006, But because I know I got them again, but I don't think I ended up reading them again. Um, maybe looked through them. So so now that we're going through them, I still remember uh, the topics because uh, his this these two uh, uh, general conference bulletins, the 1893 and the 1895, uh, were something that really affected my Christian experience at that time, especially in the early years of being an Adventist. But anyway, we're going to read here this verse, and he says uh, that we're going to deal with the same verse that we had last week. We're going to be doing it for the next few weeks. The same text that closed the study last night will be our study for several lessons yet to come. Therefore, if any part of the text should be passed over, and you think it has not been explained yet or has not been noticed even, just bear in mind that we are not nearly done with the text yet, and each part will come in its place. Ephesians 2, 13 to 18. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometime were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity or to make in himself of twain one new man still making peace. That is, he did it to make peace. Peace is made and only by this means, and it is all in himself. And he made this peace that he might reconcile both, that is Jew and Gentile, unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. The text says, thereby. The margin says, having slain the enmity in himself. The German says, having put to death the enmity through himself, and came and preached peace to you which were afar off, and to them that were nigh. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. I would mention again, as I did last night briefly, that it is the separation 
the enmity that existed between Jew and Gentile that is considered here. It is true that the destruction of that separation and enmity is considered. Uh, the taking away of it is studied and explained, and also uh, the means by which it is taken away and the destroying of it is told. That's a rather awkward sentence, but as we mentioned last night, Christ did not spend any time trying to get Jew and the Gentile, the Jew and the Gentile, as of themselves reconciled among themselves. He did not begin trying to get them to agree to put away their differences, turn over a new leaf and try to do better and forget the past and let bygones be bygones. He did not spend two minutes on that. And if he had spent 10,000 years, it would have done no good because this separation, this enmity that was between them was only the consequence, the fruit of the enmity that existed between them and God, right? So this idea uh, that we have that Jones is presenting, uh, the idea is if we have a problem between a brother, you know, two brothers, right? Two people in Christ, and you try to reconcile them uh, to each other, it's not going to do any good if they're not reconciled to God, right? That That's the idea here. But of course, reconciling people to God, you know, this is the work that Christ does. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. Um, but if people are having a problem, if somebody comes to you and says, you know, this brother, um, you know, I have a problem with him. Well, there's no point of trying to get the two to get together and reconcile their differences. Right. You need to get them reconciled to God first. Now, when we we had the disappointment in July 18th, there was a, a brother, Emmanuel was his name. And he he had suggested in one of our studies, one of our morning studies, he he wanted us to get all of the leaders together and, you know, hash things out to figure out why we had had this disappointment. And and I said, well, one is we can't do that. Like, we're, we're not anybody. We're not leaders in the movement. We can't just, you know, call everybody together to have a meeting, right? And he, he wouldn't let it go. He said, you know, you have to do this. You've got to do this. And, and it was near the end of the study. And I, I finally, you know, put him out of the study uh, so that we could close. He, and he came back in afterwards and we had a long talk and, uh, he was not happy with me, but uh, the point was that the movement did try in some ways to address July 18th, but because we weren't reconciled to God, all it ended up with was a separation in the movement. You know, even if we had all got together in the same room, it wouldn't have done us any good. What we needed was ourselves to examine our own hearts. And that is what we have been doing in all of our studies. We've been looking at ourselves. Now we have an opportunity to meet together, you know, this camp meeting in the summer, but that's not the idea of getting together and hashing things out or trying to reconcile in some way. It's an invitation to study God's word and be reconciled to God. Right? There's no just because we get together and have a meeting. You, you, if people aren't reconciled to God, it's not going to do any good. So this is the point that he's making, at least one of the points. But there's a lot more to it in understanding what the God is to be applied to our lives. Uh, therefore, in order to effectually to destroy the whole evil tree and its fruit as it stood between these, he destroyed the root of the thing by abolishing the enmity between them and God. And having done so, he came and announced the glad tidings, peace to you who were far off and to those near. And it's using his translation of the Greek there. 13th verse, therefore now, 
in Christ Jesus, you who were sometime far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Now he's focusing here on, in italics, in Christ Jesus. For he is our peace who hath made both one. It is true that he made both Jew and Gentile one, but he first made another one in order that these two, both Jew and Gentile, might be one. And before they could be made one, therefore the both in this verse that are made one are not the both of verse 18. In verse 13, the two, the both, are God and man who is separated from God, whether he be near or far off. Therefore, first, he is our peace who hath made both God and man one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between God and man, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is, the enmity which is in man against God, which is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. This he did in order that he in himself of two should make one new man so making peace the new man is not made of two men who are outs but is made of god and the man in the beginning man was made in the image of god and that signifies a good deal more than the shape of god One looking upon him would be caused to think of God. He reflected the image of God. God was suggested to whoever looked upon the man. God and the man were one. And God and the man would always have remained one, too, had not the man hearkened to Satan and received his mind, which is enmity against God. This mind, that is enmity against God, when received by the man, separated him from God. Now, they were two and not one, and being separated from God and in sin, God cannot come to him himself, for the man cannot bear the unveiled glory of his presence. Our God is a consuming fire to sin. And so for God to meet a man in that man's self or alone would be only to consume him. I mean, so the idea here, as you can see, is once man is separated from God, we need a mediator, right? Someone between God and man who is going to bring man and God together. And so in Christ, in himself, man and God are brought together so that we are not consumed. Men in sin cannot meet God alone and exist. This is shown in Revelation 6, verse 13 to 17. The great day when the heaven departs as a scroll when it is rolled together and the face of god is seen by all the wicked ones upon the earth then the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb for a great day For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? A man who is in sin, a man in and of himself meeting God, would rather have a mountain upon him than to be where that unveiled glory of God would shine upon him. Therefore, in order that God might reach man and be joined to him once more, in order that God might be revealed to man once more, and that man might be once more in the place which God made for him, Jesus gave himself, and God appeared in him with his glory so veiled in human flesh that man, sinful man, can look upon him and live. In Christ, man can meet God and live because in Christ, the glory of God is so veiled. Um, And I don't like here so modified. I don't think that's really a good word. I think veiled is better. That sinful man is not consumed. Because you can't really modify the glory of God and it still be the glory of God. Um, But it is veiled. Now, all of God is in Christ, for in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. When Jesus came to bring man once more to God, he veiled this bright, consuming glory so that now men can look upon God 
as he is in all his glory in Jesus Christ and live. Whereas out of Christ, in himself alone, no man can see God and live. In Christ, out of himself, no man can see God and not live. So when we're in Christ and out of ourself, we can see God and live. But if we're out of Christ and in ourself alone, we cannot see God and live. In Christ, to see God is to live. For in him is life, and the life is the light of man. Thus, God and man, by the enmity, were separate. But Christ comes between, and in him the man and God meet. And when God and the man meet in Christ, then those two both are one, and there is the new man. And so, and only so, peace is made. So that in Christ, God and man, Man are made as one. Consequently, Christ is the at one ment between God and the man. At one ment, making it one. Consequently, join the syllables together, and he is the atonement. O oh, and the Lord gave himself, and in himself abolished the enmity to make in himself of two, God and the man, one new man, so making peace. Now, sometimes when you read Jones, um, even though he's he's repetitive and he's being very clear, it it can seem like, well, what's the point? Like, how is it that uh, Christ unites man and God? Well, one is he is the God man, but he is not a sinful man, right? Christ doesn't sin. But he does take upon himself our sinful nature. That is, he identifies with us. And, and Jones is going to go into this in depth. And this is the problem that the in Christ motif idea that you see around Adventism, the idea that it's all in Christ, uh, doesn't really serve any purpose. Because if it's all just in Christ, and we just say, all I need to is acknowledge that it was in Christ, but not actually have to do anything, not actually have to be anything, not actually having to affect me in some way that I have a transformed character. I just trust that all of this was done in Christ for me, and I just need to somehow acknowledge that, and that makes me saved sort of defeats the whole purpose of why Christ came to save sinners, right? He had to actually transform us. And he did so by taking upon himself humanity, which Jones is going to clearly show in the next few uh, presentations. Now we come to the other both in verse 18, that he might reconcile both Jew and Gentile unto God in one body. But what body is it in which he, Christ, reconciles both unto God? His own, of course. His own in which the at one is made, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you which were far off, to the Gentile, and to them that were nigh, that is, the Jews. The Jews were nigh for their father's sakes. As in themselves, on their own merit, the Jews were separated from God and were just as far off as the Gentiles. But God had made promises to their fathers, and they were beloved for the fathers' sakes, and they had the advantage for them. For to them pertained the adoption and the glory and the covenants, and the giving of law and the service of God and the promises. In this sense, and for this cause, they were nigh, and he preached peace to them that were nigh. They needed Preach peace, preached to them. Thus, through him, we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Now, let us follow this expression that the enmity is destroyed in himself, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, having slain the enmity in himself, in himself of two, so making peace. It is all in himself. No man 
can have the benefit of it, except in him. If there be those in the audience to whom this seems obscure and who would say, I cannot see that, and would stand off and look at it as though it were something you would try to get a hold of from without, I would say to such, you will never get it in that way. That is not the way it is done. It is in him that it is done, not outside of him. In him only can it be known, not outside of him at all. Surrender to him, yield to him, sink self in him, then it will be all plain enough. Only in him it is done, and only in him can it be known. We are to study now how it was done in him, and knowing this, we shall know how it is done for every one of us in him. First of all, I would call a special attention to the expression in him. This expression is not used in the scriptures, and I shall never expect to use it in any such sense as that it is in him as in a receptacle or a reservoir to which we are to go and take out what we may need and put it upon us or apply it to ourselves. No, no, no. That is not it. It can never be gotten in that way. It is not there as in a receptacle to which we are to go and take out what we would have of him and enjoy it and apply it to ourselves and say, now I have got it. No, it is in him. And we ourselves are to be in him in order to have it. We are to sink our, ourselves in him. Our self is to be lost in him. Then he has us. Only in him it is. We find it only in him. And even when we would get it in him, it is not only by being ourselves overwhelmed in him. Never are we to think of going to get it there and take it out of him and use it to ourselves. Therefore, where the scriptures use the term in him, it means only that to all. All is in him, and we get it by being ourselves in him. Many people make a mistake here. They say, oh, yes, I believe on him. I know it is in him, and I get it from him. And they propose to take it from him and apply it to themselves. Then soon they become quite well satisfied that they are righteous, they are holy. And they get so far along at last that in their estimation it is settled fact that they are perfect and just cannot sin and are even beyond temptation. Such a view is certain to bring only such result because it is out of him and it is themselves who are doing it. Now, this reminds me of a story I've told many times, but back in 1980, must have been 1988, when I was at um, uh, Light Bears Camp Meeting in Malo, Washington. And there was uh, a guy there who's uh, a minister. His name was... Uh, I always have trouble remembering his name. Uh, he wrote a book called uh, um, uh, The Third Great Jihad. The Third Jihad. Uh, John, I uh, can't think of his last name at the moment. Anyway, it's not that important. But he was teaching that he hadn't since, since March, and this was like June or something. And um, uh, But I was reading Jones at that time. I was reading actually the 1895 General Conference Bulletin. Um, and I knew that the idea that somehow, you know, because he was teaching that we could have faith and we needed to trust that we have it. And if we trust that we have it, we will see that we have it. We will experience not sinning, right? And of course, that would be a deception because he was doing what Jones says you can't do. He's taking this and bringing it out of Christ, and then seeing himself as perfect, as righteous. And I've heard people say this type of thing. You know, they, they, they're they so satisfied with themselves that they, they don't even believe that it's possible for them to be tempted. And yet it's pretty obvious from their lives that uh, they're definitely not righteous. And, and we don't look for righteousness in ourselves or in any person because that righteousness is always in Christ. 
But that doesn't mean that righteousness doesn't exist in a person in Christ. That you understand what I'm saying. When a person's in Christ, it changes that person because Christ is in him and he is in Christ. Those two things can exist at the same time. But the person who's in Christ, those that are seeking to perfect Christian character, will never indulge the thought that they are sinless, as Ellen White says. Um, they can represent the truth. They could be living this perfect life. But because they're the closer they come to Christ, the more sinful they appear in their own eyes. That's the reason that they can experience righteousness in their lives, which is right doing, because they don't trust in themselves. But once somebody thinks that it's themselves who are doing it, they're obviously not in Christ. So to me, this was really clear. Um, so my early Christian experience, I understood this even before that, but uh, the idea that we see ourselves as sinners, even when we are righteous, 144,000 do not see themselves as righteous because they're exercising righteousness by faith they know only of christ's righteousness and because of that they can live a perfect life in the sight of a holy god without a mediator but only because they don't trust themselves they don't say i'm righteous that i'm beyond tempta temptation Okay, so Jones goes on. He says, but that is not the way. That is self still because it is out of Christ. And without me, that is outside of me, ye can do nothing. Because ye are nothing. Because we are nothing, right? In him it is, and only in him, and only as we are in him can we have it or profit by it at all. The scriptures will make that all plain. I thought best to set down this explanation so that the studies that are to come of what is done in him and what is given is in him, that we shall not make the mistake of thinking we are to find it in him and take it out. No, we are to go to him for it. There is where it is. And when we go to him, we are to enter into him by faith and the spirit of God and there remain and ever be found in him. Philippians 3.9. Turn to the book of Hebrews now, and we will study the first two chapters for the rest of the present lesson. The question now is, how did Christ abolish this enmity in his flesh, in himself? I will first state the argument in both chapters in order that we may cover the two chapters in the short, short time we shall have. Now, um, now these two chapters are extremely important. I've often presented them in Bible studies to people. Uh, especially if you're going to understand the nature of Christ um, and what salvation is. Anyway, in these two chapters, the one great thought is the contrast between Christ and the angels. I do not say that it's all there is in the two chapters, but that is the one thought that is above everything else. In the first chapter and up to the fifth verse of the second chapter is the first contrast. And in the second chapter, from the fifth verse to the end of the chapter, is the second contrast. In the first chapter and up to the fifth verse of the second is the contrast between Christ and the angels. With Christ, as far above the angels as God is, because he is God. In the second chapter, from the fifth verse onwards, is the contrast between Christ and the angels. But with Christ, as far below the angels as man, is below the angels because Christ became became man it says become but became man there is the outline of the two chapters that is the statement of the case let us read the chapter God who had sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son whom he hath appointed heir of all things by whom also he made the worlds who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power or as the german reads holding up all things by his powerful word that gives another turn to it not simply the word of his power but he carries all things holds them up by his powerful word 
And we might pause a moment upon that one statement. How many things are held up by his word? All things. The world? Yes. The sun? Yes. All the starry heavens? Yes. Does the word that made them still hold them up? Yes. Can we be numbered among the all things? Assuredly so. Will he hold you up by his powerful word? That is the only way he holds anything up. Were you ever uneasy any time in your life when you rose in the morning with the sun for fear that the sun would drop out of place before noon or before sundown? Oh, no. Were you ever uneasy when you arose with the sun for fear that you yourself as a Christian would slip out of place before sundown? You know you have been. Why were you not as uneasy as to whether the sun would drop out of the place before sundown, fearing that might slip out of place and fall as you were, that you yourself would fall? Well, of course, no one ever thinks of any such anxious question as to why the sun does not fall. It is always there and will stay there. But it is perfectly fair for the Christian to ask, why is it that the sun does not slip out of his place? And the answer is the powerful word of Jesus Christ holds the sun there and causes him to go on in his course. And that same power is to hold up the believer in Jesus. That same word is, the whole, is to hold up the believer in Jesus and the believer in Jesus is to expect it to do so, just as certainly as it holds up the sun or the moon. The same powerful word is to hold up the Christian in the Christian's course, precisely the same as it holds the sun in his course. The Christian who will put his confidence upon that word that is to hold him up, as he puts his confidence in that word that holds up the sun, will find that the word will hold him up as it holds up the sun. If you think of the scripture tomorrow morning when you arise, you will think that God is holding up the sun, and you will not wonder at it either. You will expect him to do that and will not be watching uneasily to see whether the sun will slip out of its place. No, you will simply go about your work with your mind upon the work and leave the holding up the sun, of the sun altogether to God to whom it belongs. Also tomorrow morning, when you arise with the sun, just expect that same powerful word to hold you up as it does the sun. Leave this part to God too. And go about your work with all your might and put all your mind upon your work. Let God attend to that which belongs to him and give your mind to that which he has given you to do. And thus serve God with all the mind. We cannot keep ourselves from falling. We cannot hold ourselves up. And he has not given us that task to do. This is not contradicting the text that says, let him that thinketh he standeth. Take heed lest he fall, because in this way, the man is relying upon God to hold him up and does not depend upon his own efforts. And he who constantly bears in mind that God is holding him up and that he must be held up is not going to be boasting of his ability to stand. If I had been carried in here this evening, perfect, perfectly helpless, and two or three of the brethren should have to stand here and hold me up. It would not be very becoming of me to see, say, see how I can stand? It would not, I would not be standing. I could not stand. Um, just the moment they should release their hold, I would fall. It is precisely so with the Christian. The word of God says of the Christian, to his own master he standeth or falleth, yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand, Roman Romans 14, verse 4. See the 144,000 symbol there. And the man whom God is holding up, who is trusting in God to hold him up, and knows that it is God alone who is making him stand, it is impossible for that man to begin to say, I'm standing now, and therefore there's no danger of my falling. Is there any danger of a man's falling while God holds him up? Of course not. It is only when he takes himself out of the Lord's hand and begins to try to hold himself up and then boast that he can stand, it is then that there is not only danger, but the thing is done. He has already fallen. He takes himself out of God's hand 
and he is bound to fall. So one of the things in our experience, when we experience Christ's righteousness, when we depend upon Christ for righteousness, we will see ourselves as sinners. We will see ourselves as unable to hold ourselves up. But it doesn't mean that we just give up and just accept that we are sinners and that we're just going to go on and sinning and I'm just going to keep sinning till Jesus comes back. And I just need his forgiveness to cover me. What we recognize is that salvation is God holding us up. It's his righteousness that's needed in our lives. And people always take these things, even things that Joan says here, and take them out of their context and try to say, well, you know, you know, God is, is holding us up, but we're not really standing. We're not really righteous. But that's not what Jones is saying. I mean, obviously, we don't have righteousness in and of ourselves. We have Christ's righteousness. It's seen upon us. His glory is seen upon us. And so it's not an excuse for sin to say, well, I'm a sinner and, I, and I'm unable to do righteousness, so I'm just going to accept that I'm never going to be righteous. That's not an excuse. We need Christ's righteousness in ourselves because Christ needs to be in us just as much as we need to be in Christ. Jones goes on, quotes, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. So that's from Hebrews chapter one. Um, when did he sit down on the right hand of God? How long ago? Way back yonder when he arose from the dead and went to heaven nearly 1900 years ago. But notice, he had purged our sins before he sat down there. When he had, past tense, by himself purged our sins, sat down. Are you glad of this? Are you glad that he purged your sins so long ago as that? In him it is, in him we find it. Let us, be, let us thank him, it is so, the word says so. Being made so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance, obtained a more excellent name than they. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, And let all the angels of God worship him. And of the angels he saith, who maketh his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. But unto the Son, he saith, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. What is his name? What does the Father call him? God. Thy throne, O God. Then that is his name. How did he get it? Fourth verse. As he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they, than the angels. You and I have a name that we have by inheritance. We may have four or five names, but we have only one name that we got by inheritance, and that is our father's name. And that name we have just as soon as we exist and just because we exist. By the very fact of our existence, we have that name. It belongs to us by nature. The Lord Jesus hath by inheritance obtained this name of God. Then that name belongs to him just because he exists. It belongs to him by nature. What nature is his then? Precisely the nature of God. And God is his name because that is what he is. He was not something else and then named that to make him that. But he was that and was called God because he is God. And he goes on and quotes more. That a scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore, God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. The Father, still speaking, says, And thou, Lord, in the beginning, hath laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thine hands. They shall perish, but thou remainest. And they shall wax old as doth a garment, and as a vesture shalt thou fold them up. And they shall be changed, but thou art the same. No change with him. Notice the connection in these words. They shall perish, 
but thou remainest. They shall be changed. Thou art the same. When these perish and pass away, there's no passing away to him. Thou remainest. When these are folded up and changed, there's no change in him. Thou art the same. And thy years shall not fail. But to which of the angels said he at any time, sit on my right hand, and I will make thine enemies thy footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be the heirs of salvation? Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders and with diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost, according to his own will. Jones goes on, there is the contrast between Christ and the angels so far. And where is Christ in the contrast? Where God is, with the angels worshiping him. And if an angel's word was steadfast and received a just recompense of reward, when it was disregarded, how shall we escape if we neglect the word of him who is higher than the angels? How shall we escape if we neglect the word of God spoken by himself? Now turn to the other contrast, Ephesians 2 verse 5. For unto the angels hath he put in subjection the world to come, whereof we speak. There are those two worlds of which we spoke last night. God said, I will put enmity between man and Satan. And that gives man a chance to choose this which world. We have chosen the world to come. Unto the angels hath he put in subjection that world. He, he hath he not put in subjection that world either. That is the thing he is talking about. The world to come, which we have chosen, is not put in subjection to the angels. But one in a certain place testified, saying, what is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou visitest him? Now, what is the purpose? What is the force of putting the word but in there? He has not put it in, put it in subjection to the angels, but he has said of man, so-and-so. Does that suggest that he has put it in subjection to, to man? What do you think? Look at it again. Unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come, whereof we speak, but. What part of speech is but? It is a conjunction. The conjunction joins two parts of a sentence. But this is a peculiar type, kind of conjunction. It is a disjunctive conjunction. A juncture is a joining. Conjunct is to join together. Disjunct is to separate. That is, there is a word that both joins and separates. This is a conjunction in that it joins the clauses. It is a disjunctive in that it separates the thoughts that are in the two sentences or clauses, as the case may be. Many people say, I believe the Bible, but. Yes, I believe the Lord forgives sins, but. Yes, I confess my sins, but. That but disjoins them from everything they have said. It shows that they do not believe at all what they have said. What are the two things then that are separated by this but in Hebrews 2 verse 6? First, who are the two persons who are separated by the but? One is the angels and the other is man. He is not put in subjection to the angels, the world to come. But has put it in subjection to somebody and that somebody is man. Let, it, let us study it for that blessed truth but one in a certain place testified saying what is man that thou art mindful of him or the son of man that thou visitest him thou made him a little lower than the angels thou crownedest him with glory and honor and didst set him over the works of thy hands thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet for in that he put all in subjection under him he hath left nothing 
that is not put under him. But now we see not yet all things put under him. But we see Jesus. Where do we see Jesus? We see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels. There is the contrast again between Christ and the angels. In the other contrast, we saw Jesus higher than the angels. Here we see him lower than the angels. Why? Because man was made lower than the angels and by sin went still lower even. Now we see certainly as it is true that as Jesus was where God is, so certainly he has come to where man is. There's another thought we want to put right with that. He who was God, where God is, is with man, where man is. And he who was with God, as God is, is with man, as man is. And he who was one with God, as God is, is one with man, as man is. And so certainly, as his was the nature of God yonder, so certainly his is the nature of man here. So we know that the controversy within Adventism, especially what we saw in the 80s and 90s regarding the nature of Christ, um, Jones totally destroys that, that, that view that Jesus had a sinless human nature. But in Adventism... What, year, uh, what yeah. year in the 80s, uh, what conference or year in the 80s did that come about, the nature of Christ? Um, what, well, it was everywhere in Adventism. Oh, okay. Are you just saying generally everywhere? Okay. Yeah, basically everywhere. Now, part of it was because of what happened. Um, question on doctrine? Was it a question on doctrine started that? Well, no. Um, I mean, obviously, questions on doctrine had a part to play in the discussion. But the fruit of questions on doctrine was Desmond Ford's theology so oh, yeah. so you have to realize there was some people like um um i can't think of his name what's his name ml andreason who wrote um against he actually wrote what was called the letters to the churches where he was writing to adventists telling them what was happening with these evangelical conferences and warning them about this docu document, Seventh-day Adventist answer, questions on doctrine. Oh. But for, for the average Adventist, they weren't really aware of what was going on. They just accepted what was said in, in the book uh, because it was cleverly disguised. And, and, and it was um, basically a type of uh, equivocation that is a type of argument where you just – play around with the meanings of words. So if you if you say something a certain way, but you define it to mean something other than what it naturally would say, then over time, people are going to interpret it the, the way that it has actually said. I know that's not maybe as clear, but if you define, you know, that Jesus had a sinless human nature, but you really try to mean he had a sinful nature, but he didn't sin, right? Then over time, people are going to take it, well, Jesus had a sinless nature, a sinless human nature, and that's why he didn't sin. Right. So so this is, is part of the problem is that people can play around with words. It's called equivocation. They can equivocate, right? They can give, they can use one meaning of a word at one time, and then replace it with that, that same word with another meaning, and they can kind of fool you. But when Desmond Ford rejected the sanctuary doctrine and the investigative judgment and all those things, and then they finally defrocked him in August of, uh, on August 15th, uh, 1980, um, the, the whole point was is that we now saw the fruit of it happened in, in the evangelical conferences and before. So this had been happening in Adventism for a long time. So in the 1980s, um, it definitely became a, a big issue because of the fourth issue. But we also had it, you know, rising 
up again and again at different times. I mean, we had, um, yeah. um, I can't think of the guy's name in uh, the 60s. Um, what was his name? Uh, anyway, there was different people who were teaching off. They were teaching, you know, not true righteousness by faith. And so the whole issue became very confused within Adventism. There's Brimsmead, Robert Brimsmead. Right. And so, you know, a lot of happened with Robert Brimsmead and then Ford. Um, but what the church finally did with the nature of Christ is they just, they just, they sort of, in a sense, gave in to the wording. Um, and so a lot of people uh, accepted what the church said because they could interpret it. You know, it's, uh, you know, it's sort of like you write a language that everybody can accept. You write a doctrine, you word it in such a way that even people who believe the opposite can accept it. And, and I had this experience. We had a pastor in our church in Warburg who... Uh, was very upset with what we were teaching about the nature of Christ. And he tried to use uh, the 27 fundamental beliefs, you know, seven day Adventist belief that book. He tried to use that book uh, to support the idea that Jesus has a sinless nature, not a sinful nature, but we would read the exact same passages in that book and see them completely opposite. Um. Mm -hmm. Right. And to me, I read it. I said, well, no, it's plainly says Jesus has a sinful nature, you know, the way I read it. So, you know, so that's what committees can do. They can figure out how to write something in a way that everybody can agree with it, even if they believe opposite things. So that's why, you know, language is meant for communication, not for obfuscation. So um, anyway, hopefully that helps a little bit. Yeah. So we see Jesus made a little lower than the angels, right? And this is the contrast. So Jones brings us here. There is another thought we want to put right with that. He who was with God where God is, is with man where man is. And he who was with God as God is, is with man as man is. And he who was one with God as God is, is one with man as man is. And so certainly as his was the nature of God yonder. So certainly his is the nature of man here. And then he's, of course, it's clear what man's nature is, right? Let us there, let us read this blessed fact now in the scriptures. And that will close the lesson for tonight, 10th verse. For it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one. Christ sanctifies, and it is men who are sanctified. And how many of them, how many are there of them? One. It was Christ and God in heaven. And how many were there of them? One in nature. How is he with man on earth, and how many of them are of them? One, all of one. For which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare the name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. I think it should be declare my name unto my brethren, but um, I think that's a typo. Anyway, that time is coming soon when Christ in the midst of the church will lead the singing lead the singing remember this is christ speaking in these quotations and again i will put my trust in him this is christ speaking through the psalms too and again behold i and the children which god hath given me for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood he also likewise took part of the same that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him 
the seed of Abraham. Wherefore, in all things, it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren. He who was one of God has become one of man. We will follow the thought further tomorrow night. For us, that will be next Friday. <clears throat> so that's where we're going to leave off. Um, so, of course, this, this idea that Christ took upon himself our nature in its fallen condition, as Ellen White says, not the nature of, of man before Adam fell. Because if he had taken the nature of man before Adam fell, he would only be able to save those who have that nature. He had to take the nature of those that he came to save. Now, it is true that Christ did not sin. So in saying that Christ had a sinful nature, we're not saying that Christ sinned. Which some people argue, well, if you have a sinful nature, you automatically sin because you have a sinful nature. And that's why they try to distance Christ from having a sinful nature. They don't understand it's Christ's connection with the Father, how he overcame. But Christ lived kind of with prayer with prayer and his word, you know, kept the communication going. Yeah, so I mean think about it. If if you have God coming in sinless nature, sinless human nature. It's not much of a, a miracle that he would live a perfect life of righteousness by faith. Yeah, well, what, could, where, where, where would our, our, yeah, and where would our example be? Right. Yes, yeah. So he wouldn't be our example of righteousness by faith. He would be an example that of of something else. But Christ right. had to live righteousness by faith. Now, yep. uh, now this is why Parminder. In 2017, um, he began this work of the study on the nature of man. And I've pointed out before um, that what Parminder was teaching was not um, that Jesus had a sinful nature. He didn't like that idea at, at, at all. Um, I'm going to read um, this here. I can find it. Is that from Parminder? Parminder? Yeah, the baptismal vows. Oh, yeah, I remember that. Uh, yeah. Well, it's been a while ago. I probably don't remember that. <laughs> See if this is the right one. That one's not going to yeah, I, I was baptized under those vows. <laughs> well, I got baptized under them, but I, I, I didn't accept uh, so because I, I had them clarified that I didn't accept the vows. Uh, so here you see, um, this is the baptismal vows. We're going to look at the part dealing with the nature of man. Yeah. Um, so this was... Uh, so. Um, so he's going to use this term mortal body, right? So the uh, first place we see it, uh, do you believe in the conversion is, is the new birth, new birth experience? Do you believe that unless you are first born of the spirit, which is the baptism of repentance, forgiveness and justification and of obedience and sanctification, followed by being born of water, which is the baptism by immersion and the declaration of this new birth, that you cannot enter the kingdom of God? Do you believe that justification is not only the work of Christ in forgiving us of our past sins, but also the power to live presently in this mortal body without sin? And of course, that sounds really good, right? Sounds like, but, but Parminder has used a lot of equivocation here. So even when we understand how he taught the nature of man, um, he doesn't really mean what he says. And then we go here. Um, so he says, the means by which this rescue was effected was by Christ coming to this earth in a fallen sinful human body identical to ours, within which he united divinity and humanity. Despite coming in a fallen sinful body, he was still separate from sinners. 
Now, why is Parminder using a fallen sinful human body and not fallen sinful human nature? Yeah, it's kind of uh, funny. Yeah, and, and I pointed it out to him that, you know, Jesus came in a fallen sinful human nature. But, yeah. but uh, Parminder had been trying to destroy this whole idea of what human nature is. And he tried to take it that it's, it's just the body. So Christ came in our bodies, but he didn't take upon himself our nature. Right? That is the point that Parminder is trying to make. Wow. And so this is an example of people can play around with words to avoid something that would, and even when he talks about, see, part of the problem here, too, is because um, when they're talking about righteousness, that is doing right, obeying God, it's a very low standard of righteousness. That is, many of the people um, that were following Parminder, um, one, one of them believed that they were sinless, right? And yeah. that's you know, so the one one brother, you know, he was saying that he he was sinless. You know, he he didn't sin, and he was right. like, uh, quite a vile person. Um, <laughs> and uh, and had no idea that he was, because in his mind he was righteous, and so he couldn't even see that he was a sinner. And and it was Parminder's teaching that was getting him to do that. There was another brother, too, who said, yeah, until Parminder presented that nature of, of man, I, you know, I just saw myself as a sinner. Right? Uh, so now, yeah. now I have the key to overcoming sin. Right? Which is just the human imagination. Right? The people can imagine that they're righteous. But if we understand what this fallen sinful human nature is, man came, Jesus came, in sinful human nature. He took upon himself our nature in its fallen condition, not our body in its fallen condition. So this was um, a way that Parminder was thinking, right? Now, the thing is, I mean, he could have just put in fallen sinful human nature because it wouldn't really matter because he, so many things that are in these baptismal vows, he later recants on that is, he shows them all to be error anyway. So part of what he was doing is he was trying to look like he was a conservative Adventist. But he had these yeah. little things that he couldn't just let himself do because this was like central to his understanding of righteousness by faith, which, of course, is just self-righteousness by faith. And that's why Parminder could trust instead of trusting in God to take care of his truth. Right. He yeah. had to control it. Right. Yeah. He had to work politically to bring about his means. And you can see how that would fit in with his understanding of righteousness by faith. Because if you believe that you're righteous and that you're good, well, then God really needs you to act and support his truth and do all these different things. And if somebody uh, challenge you on what you believe to be the truth, about something, you have to personally take it and fight for it because, you know, you're perfect, right? You're righteous. But if you trust in God for righteousness, you will also trust in him that he can take care of his own truth and that your responsibility is to live the truth, not to control other people. And if you can live the truth, if you can be an example, if you can trust that God is going to take care of this situation that really is out of your hands because it's other people, then God can use you and God's truth can be vindicated. Right. So you can see how righteousness by faith, our correct understanding of it is essential for us to act correctly in the types of situations that exist with human beings, with others with conflicts and controversies. Because in a sense, uh, just as other people's lives 
are not in our, our control. In some ways, our life is not in, in, we have no control over our own life. That is, we can't produce righteousness. We can, though, give our heart to Christ. We can give our life to Christ. We can depend upon him. And we can trust in his righteousness that it will be worked out in the life. And we don't have to look for it. Just to, to know that we're trusting in God, all we need to know is that we're sinners and that that is our only hope. And so the 144,000 have no self-dependence, no trust in self. Their confidence only is in Christ because they can see, just like Christ could see in himself, no good thing. Same with the 144,000. Even though they have a sinful nature, Christ had a sinful nature. He could see in himself no good thing, but he could know by faith that he was the son of God. So now Jones is going to go into this more. And he's going to basically, if you compared what Parminder was teaching in 2017 um, and what Jones teaches here, it, it's complete opposite. But the thing is, I tried to point this out. And I, and I didn't know where, where Parminder was going. I wasn't there for all of his presentations. I was there just for the first few because I had to go back to Canada. So I was there till like September 23rd or something like that. And Parminder had just come, I don't know, maybe a week or so before that. So I saw the first week of his presentations. But the fruit of the fruit of a teaching is the way that you can tell whether something is true or not. And the fruit of that was his followers. That was where I was not impressed. And, and I thought, though at first, that these people were just not really following Parminder, that they were just fanatical. Um, and that if Parminder knew what people were uh, believing, that he, had, he would realize that he needed to correct this. But as time went on, I started to realize that this is actually what Parminder believed. Right? That's why they could believe November 9th, 2019 was going to be that him that is righteous be righteous still. Because they believed that they were righteous. So, and of course, that's not really how it happens. Those that are righteous would never think that they're righteous. But anyway... Any other thoughts or questions before we close with prayer? Not for me. Okay, well, let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful for the Sabbath and uh, we're thankful for the time that we can have to study your word together. We're thankful for the words of A.T. Jones, for the words of scripture that he shared so long ago. And we ask, Lord, that um, we can look to you for righteousness, that you can work out in us your will, that we can trust in you alone. Help us, Lord, to continue to study your word and to learn and to grow and to see our true spiritual condition. Be with each person. May you watch over them. And uh, we pray for the study tomorrow morning, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.